Hi, thank you all. Uh, first, I want to thank everybody for participating today. My name is uh, Bill Mulligan. I'm the CEO of Cordium US. Uh, Cordium is a, a global regulatory compliance consulting and software firm uh, with about 170 people working worldwide from offices in London, New York, Boston, San Francisco, Malta, and Hong Kong. Uh, before we get going with today's webinar, I just want to hit some housekeeping points. Number one, uh, you know, we encourage people to submit questions to the extent that you're interested in posing a question. Uh, we'd like you to use the uh, question box, which is on the right-hand side of the screen. You can click into that box and submit a question. We will do our best uh, to answer all the questions posed. Um, before I review the agenda, I just wanted to let everybody know we're very, very lucky today to have a fantastic panel that brings a variety of perspectives to this webinar. Uh, our first panelist uh, is Barry Rashkover. He's a partner at Sidley Austin in their Securities and Derivatives Enforcement and Regulatory Group. Uh, Barry is a former senior official in the SEC's Enforcement Division. Uh, we've also got David Heathfield, who is a partner and general counsel at Barron's Mead. Uh, Barron's Mead is an independent specialist risk insurance broker focused on the alternative investment management industry. Uh, we are also joined by James Lowry. He's the Director and Head of Asset Management Underwriting at Apsley Specialty Limited. Uh, Apsley is an underwriting agency focused solely on the asset management sector. Um, and then finally, we've got Kurt Alfrey, uh, who is a colleague of mine and the co-founder of Strategic Enforcement Advisors. Cordium has entered into a strategic relationship with his firm um, um, around a, 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 a variety of initiatives. Uh, Kurt's got a long history in the hedge fund space, including roles as a general counsel and a CCO at a firm that has had ex extensive interactions uh, with the SEC Enforcement D Division and will bring some interesting perspectives today. Um, that will lead us to the agenda slide. Um, um, in the first instance, I'm going to sort of set the stage. Um, 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 then we're going to hand off to, to Barry to give us some historical perspective around enforcement. And then we'll get some viewpoints from the, from the insurance industry, and then we'll talk about preparation. But in just setting the stage, um, just a, a couple of things to think about. I know a, a lot of times when we're talking about SEC-registered uh, managers that are based in the UK or in Europe, we're talking about the issue of whether you're a sort of a fully registered advisor or what would be referred to as exempt reporting advisor. Just a reminder today, we're really not talking about those issues per se as it relates to the likelihood of having sort of a routine audit um, with what's referred to of the Office of Compliance Inspections and Examinations, referred to as OCIE. I do think, um, when we'll hear perspectives from others today, that uh, if you are a fully registered advisor, there's probably a, likely, a higher likelihood that at some point you will have an interaction with enforcement because you will have interactions with OC and as people will speak to you today, there could be a likelihood that something be referred from a sort of routine audit over to enforcement. But that being said, um, I think it is important to note, and we'll hear from today, that you know that exempt reporting advisors are most definitely on the radar screen of the SEC via your submission of an ADP. And I think to the extent that in some way, shape, or form um, that they got information that an exempt reporting advisor was doing something that warranted and interaction, either whether it be formal or informal, with enforcement, then enforcement would be able to do so, um, although those advisors, as I said, would not be subject to routine examination. So with that, we've set the stage. We reviewed the agenda. Um, and it's my pleasure to hand it off uh, to Barry for the first part of the webinar. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about the enforcement landscape um, at, at, at a fairly high level. Um, we've, we've included a, 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 a large number of slides, um, and they're there for your reference. I'm not going to cover every single one in, in um, my remarks. Um, the, the SEC's enforcement um, agenda uh, puts investment advisors um, and hedge funds sort of really uh, as one of their, their key focuses. And you know, it, 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 if you are a non-U.S. advisor um, but have uh, some U.S. connection, um, you may well find yourself caught in the middle of an enforcement investigation. Uh, uh, it, 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 even if you're an advisor headquartered outside the United States, 
Um, if you offer and sell uh, security, securities or interest in your fund in the United States, uh, 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 certainly the SEC will take the view that uh, that in theory, if you, you if you violate the securities laws, a court could have subject matter jurisdiction over you. And certainly, if you, if you if you have some operations in the United States, um, it becomes even easier for them to take that that position. And so, um, in, increasingly, I think uh, even non-U.S. advisors uh, uh, bear some some risk of of SEC enforcement action um, and, and an SEC investigation. Uh, the, the commission is the principal U.S. agency for enforcing. U.S. securities laws, but because those laws are so broad, um, they, they cover not just registrants, they cover not just registered broker-dealers or registered investment advisors, they can cover, for example, any investment advisor or anybody who commits fraud in connection with the purchase or sale of securities, no matter who that person is. Uh, the SEC really cuts a pretty broad net, casts a pretty broad net. Um, and it, it, a lot of people who otherwise might not think of themselves as really regulated by the SEC still could find themselves um, involved in an enforcement investigation. Um, when the SEC uh, conducts in, in enforcement activity, really there are two there are two stages really. Um, the first is the investigation. And the second is if they decide that someone's actually violated the securities laws and they feel compelled to bring charges. Um, the, the, the investigation is usually the main battlefield. I mean, because that's where you want to try to show the SEC that you haven't done anything wrong. That's where they will examine books and records. They can take testimony. Investigations can go on for years. Um, usually at the end of the investigation, the parties have a good sense of where they stand. The SEC staff knows whether they feel that the facts warrant enforcement action, uh, and everybody sort of knows the strengths and weaknesses of the respective cases. That's when the SEC staff decides whether to bring the action or not. If they bring an enforcement action, it's a civil case. The SEC doesn't have authority to bring criminal cases, but they sometimes team up with criminal authorities, um, such as U.S. Attorney's Offices and Department of Justice, who do have a, a parallel criminal jurisdiction. Um, what kind of cases does the SEC tend to, to, tend to bring? Um, it, they, they tend to bring cases involving, there's, a, there's a, a graph in front of you, 2003 to 2013. You know, their, their cases fall within well, so year after year, they, they basically fall within very similar categories. And you can see here market manipulation, insider trading, financial fraud is basically accounting fraud, securities offerings, that often includes illegal offerings such as Ponzi schemes, delinquent filers, technical broker dealer cases, um, investment advisor, investment company. You can see that you know, sort of year after year, the types of enforcement cases that they bring pretty much remain fairly fairly stable. You can see that how in the earlier part of the 2000, say 2003 through 2007, you can see that the commission brought a lot more big financial fraud, accounting fraud cases, and, and that's no surprise because that period coincided with some of the big um, accounting fraud blowouts like Enron and Adelphia Computer Associates, uh, WorldCom. Um, uh, you can see how those have sort of those trailed off a little bit. You can also see that, interestingly enough, although insider trading cases get a lot of publicity uh, and um, uh, uh, are certainly an important priority for the agency, interestingly enough, sort of year in and year out, the actual percentage of, of the SEC's enforcement docket that's dedicated to insider trading cases pretty much remains stable. Um, here's, another, here's another chart showing you sort of similar categories for 2013. Um, the SEC, I think, I think it's pretty clear from reading the, 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 the press, 
has become more aggressive um, from an enforcement angle over the past, say, five years, um, and especially over the past year and a half with Chair Mary Jo White. Uh, the, 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 and that, and that, that means especially for registrants. Um, what, that, what that has come to me is that um, infractions, uh, technical violations of the securities laws that in, in years past might simply be uh, uh, enough for a deficiency letter but not an enforcement investigation or enforcement action um, uh, no longer no, no longer are, are just limited to deficiency letters. Things that previously would just be that now really are becoming the focus of enforcement investigations and enforcement actions. Um, likewise, you can see the actual monetary sanctions that the agency is getting um, is, is on an upswing. So you can see in 2008, sort of the SEC you know, obtained in total a little over a billion dollars in monetary sanctions in all enforcement cases. You can see how much that grows since 2009 2013. Uh, so it, it's clearly become a, a much more, much more aggressive agency. What that also means is that is that the the SEC enforcement staff, how they conduct their investigations, um, they've become tougher um, and uh, far more aggressive. Uh, leading the SEC's enforcement division is a former assistant, former criminal prosecutor, and Andrew Ceresny. Chair White, um, herself as a former uh, a criminal prosecutor, formerly the, 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 the U.S. attorney for the, for the most important U.S. attorney's office when it comes to securities cases, the Southern District of New York. Um, and they, they've taken some of the sharp, sharp elbowed, aggressive criminal prosecutor enforcement tactics that they, that they learned and used when they were criminal prosecutors, and they've begun to um, uh, encourage the enforcement staff to use similar to use similar tactics. Um, what triggers an SEC investigation? Um, uh, it, it can be a lot of things. Um, increasingly, uh, investor or whistleblower complaints are triggering investigations. Uh, the SEC over the past five years has dedicated a lot more resources to building a, a whistleblower office and to take whistleblower tips and complaints a lot more seriously, to have a far more methodical way of handling whistleblower tips and complaints than it did in the past. And a lot of that stems from the Madoff scandal, where the SEC was very, very sharply criticized for not taking a particular whistleblower's complaint as seriously as, uh, in hindsight, people think it should. Um, uh, so whistleblower complaints are an important source of enforcement. Um, financial statements, uh, significant financial reporting, news coverage, civil litigation, all sources for SEC investigations. Um, you can see how whistleblower tips and, 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 and tips of complaints, uh, what kind of categories they, they've involved uh, over the you know since since the SEC has been keeping careful careful track of them. Um, SEC investigations, as I said, it's really the main that's really the main the, the main event when it comes to enforcement because after the investigation, although parties can litigate if they disagree with the enforcement charges the SEC wants to bring, after several years of investigation, and they can go on for several years, uh, the parties pretty much know where they stand. Uh, the facts are all out there, the legal theories are out there, the parties have had lots of communications about, about you know, their respective views of the case. Now, if you don't, if, if the SEC staff wants to bring charges and, and, and you don't want to settle, well, there's nothing that makes you, and then you can litigate them in federal district court or before an administrative law judge. But, but, but almost but most SEC investigations, if they result in uh, an interest by the staff to bring enforcement action, result in, result in settlements. There are two general stages of the investigation, the informal stage and the formal stage. The main difference between the two is 
in a formal investigation, the SEC staff has the authority to issue subpoenas and to compel testimony and for unregulated entities to compel the production of, of, of documents. Um, SEC investigations are non-public and confidential. So if you call up the SEC staff and ask them whether they're investigating a certain entity or individual, they won't be able to tell you that. Um, they actually violate some very important rules if they tell you that. And, and for good reason, right? Because many SEC investigations end with the decision that no one has violated the law at all. Um, and wouldn't it be demonstrably unfair if uh, the SEC publicized that it was conducting an investigation and tarnished so much reputation uh, only to conclude that actually there was no misconduct at all. That said, an SEC investigation presents important issues for a company and for an advisor um, because independently that advisor or that entity might decide that it has an obligation to disclose the existence of an investigation. And whether an investigation has to be disclosed and, and when are difficult questions that you confront if, if you're under investigation. Uh, and it may turn on, is it a formal or informal investigation? Uh, has the commission staff signaled that they may be bringing charges through something called a Wells notice? Um, have they started issuing subpoenas? How, what are the issues in the investigation, and are they likely to have a material impact on the advisor or on the fund? Um, all questions that come into, into, into play when you have to decide whether you're going to disclose an investigation. Um, SEC investigation twists and turns. As I mentioned before, they can be protracted, the complex affairs, they can take, they can take years. Um, that's because the SEC staff in an investigation um, can issue you know, extensive uh, document requests and successive ones. There is really no limitation on how many document requests the SEC staff can issue um, and really on what documents they, they can see. Of course, they can't seek documents that are protected by attorney-client privilege or other legal protections. Uh, but but when it comes to the business records of an investment advisor, you know, generally, you know, mostly they're, they're going to be fair game. And the SEC staff is not afraid to see millions of pages of documents and use the tools they have to ferret through those to try to find out what they think is, is and is not important. Um, they can take testimony from, from lots of witnesses. They can compel that testimony through subpoena. If they don't do that. They can seek it voluntarily. And, 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 and more often than not, when, when, when the SEC say, staff seeks voluntary testimony, people give it because they want to try to persuade the SEC staff that no one did anything wrong. Um, discovery in an SEC investigation is generally a one-way street. They can take um, discovery from, from you. They can get a lot of information from you. But they are, at least in an investigation, not duty-bound to share what they have. Um, although there is a five-year statute of limitations, that does apply to some aspects of SEC enforcement actions. There is no one statute of limitations that applies all, you know, all together to an SEC enforcement action. The five-year statute of limitations that does exist applies to certain types of remedies the SEC can get if it actually brings an enforcement action, but there's no per se statute of limitations. That means that the SEC can seek information going far back, um, uh, and, and they often do so. One thing to keep in mind when it comes to when it comes to an investigation is if you're a non-U.S. entity, um, just because your documents and your witnesses reside overseas doesn't mean that um, the SEC won't seek them, and it doesn't mean that you won't end up producing them. Uh, you know, often, for example. If, if the entity has information overseas, but it has, if it has a U.S. registrant, um, it may well, a U.S. registrant um, uh, either itself or through an affiliate, it may well be that the SEC takes the position that that registrant has the relevant, relevant books and records and it can compel the production that way. Um, it may well be that even if there is no re U.S. registrant, if you offered and sold securities in the United States, interest say in the hedge fund, 
in the United States, um, you know, a court could conclude that you, that the SEC staff, has jurisdiction over 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 the entity. Um, the SEC is, it has 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 memoranda of understanding with foreign regulators, um, and it, and it, and it can and does seek the assistance of foreign regulators uh, when trying to seek information from uh, overseas entities that have had some conduct that involves the United States. So, for example, the SEC has, has, a, has a, a, a memorandum of understanding with the British FCA um, and can use the FCA to try to compel uh, witnesses to give interviews um, in the United Kingdom that the SEC can use in its enforcement investigation. Um, likewise, uh, just because you're in the, the UK, if the SEC wants an individual's testimony, and you happen to step foot in the United States, the SEC can, uh, there's nothing that prevents the SEC from serving you with a subpoena when you get into the United States. Um, it's important when you are a UK-based entity, or, or any non-US entity for that matter, that your counsel not only be the US counsel that can handle the SEC investigation, but be home country counsel, UK counsel, for example, that can guide you through the nuances of how the SEC's request for information might uh, conflict with local law. Um, and so, for example, when, when, when we represent um, non-U.S. entities in SEC investigations, we have to be acutely aware of home country privacy laws that may, um, may prevent the actual production of information to the SEC or may require certain, um, certain procedures for the production of information um, to the SEC. That's not a job for U.S. counsel. That's, that's a job for home com country counsel that U.S. counsel will, will, will work with. Um, high level, what are, what are some of the SEC's um, big, big priorities and, and where are they heading? Um, briefly, they're focusing a lot more on analytics to identify misconduct. So, for example, if you're a, a hedge fund, you have had consistently good returns year in and year out um, uh, without any down quarters, any down years. To the SEC, that's suspicious. Um, I mentioned that some infractions are, are, are now the subject of enforcement action that otherwise wouldn't be. That's what the chair calls for broken windows approach. SEC is focusing a lot more on gatekeepers, such as lawyers, compliance officials, directors. Um, as I said, far more aggressive staff seek frequently now seeking admissions when parties settle enforcement actions, focus not just on entities, but on the economy of individuals. Um, uh, those are some of the, the, sort of the key trends. Um, and as you can see from my, my final slide, uh, some of the substantive priorities when it comes to advisors, insider trading, allocation of investment opportunity, allocation of advisory expenses, cross trades, um, the adequacy of policies and procedures and other conflicts of interest. Um, and so with that um, high level overview of the enforcement landscape, let me turn it over to David. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about insurance. I'll try and keep it as short and as concise as possible. Um, as was mentioned at the start, um, Barron's Mead is an insurance broking and risk management um, business for the investment management industry. We act for about um, 100 managers, uh, many of whom are registered with the, with the SEC, um, and if not with the SEC, then certainly with the FCA. Um, and so the, the issue, or in fact how to deal with regulatory exposures um, and the potential costs that can arise from regulatory investigations has been the, the subject of, of much discussion uh, in the investment management or in the insurance investment management industry for some time. And I think it's fair to say that certainly over the last year or so, um, quite a lot of progress has been made as insurers and insurers have you know, faced the prospect that actually um, dealing with regulatory investigations and the costs associated with those investigations is just as important, if not 
perhaps even more important than general litigation, which is um, certainly over the last couple of years is a lot less uh, few and far between. So we've heard about how the SEC is increasing its activities, um, and so to the FCA. FCA has really been sort of pulled up on its breaches by the SEC and is, is becoming increasingly active. Uh, so it is extremely important to, sh to ensure that the insurance program uh, that managers provide, uh, that managers buy, provides adequate protection for individuals and, of course, the corporate entity in the event that either of those uh, become the subject of an investigation. Um, so how does, the, how does the cover work? Well, the starting point for regulatory exposures is really to realize that in the vast majority of cases, um, in fact, the overwhelming majority of cases, the insurance policies will not provide cover for um, fines or penalties uh, imposed as a result of an investigation. There is a bit more flexibility on the DNO side um, to the extent that civil fines imposed against um, individuals may be covered, but that's um, a difficult area. So the uh, general consensus is that fines and penalties are not covered. The key here is to ensure that the regulatory cover that you have under the uh, insurance program um, covers the costs incurred for dealing with the regulatory investigations um, prior to and after the onset of proceedings. So um, the cost of instructing external lawyers, which as we've already heard, can be uh, extremely high. Um, the just before I get on to, to who is covered, um, it's, it's still fairly commonplace, although I have to admit it's a lot less commonplace than it was, that um, some insurance policies will still include exclusions, either excluding any types of losses resulting from regulatory uh, investigations, or if it's not a blanket exclusion, an exclusion relating to um, certain sections of alleged breach of sections of the um, Securities Exchange Act. Um, so. That's the starting point to make sure that those exclusions aren't included in the policy. In terms of who is covered, oh, the, cover for, the cover for the entities um, is usually um, relatively straightforward. But as we've seen, um, certainly from fairly recent investigations, um, it's individuals as opposed to the entities that are increasingly becoming um, at the target of the investigations that are being brought directly into the into the firing line. Um, and in those types of cases, uh, it's the prospect of personal exposure that makes it critically important to, to obviously get the cover right for the individuals that are reliant on their, their PI or their DNO policies, sorry, ENO um, for, for the uh, American audience. Um, one way of achieving cover for the individuals is, is to make sure there's a broad definition of what constitutes an insured person um, when acting in a managerial or indeed professional capacity. Um, it might seem a bit um, simple, but in terms of the policies that I write on behalf of um, Barron's Meeting, when we place them into the insurance market, we always try and list the various types of officers. So we'll, we'll list GCs, for example, um, CFOs, CIOs, any um, uh, specific role that an offer, officer takes on. Uh, just to ensure there's no ambiguity when it comes to um, or those individuals attempting to rely on, on cover under their policies. Um, individuals themselves are not always the target, but nevertheless, invariably, still tend to incur costs. Um, a common issue in terms of policy response is where the entity quite often is the target of an investigation, but it's the individuals, um, uh, as has already been mentioned, that are asked to attend interviews and, and give evidence as part of a wider investigation. Uh, in terms of policy response and coverage, you need to, one needs to be careful to avoid the situation where individual directors, professionals, um, are asked to attend interviews. Um, they instruct their own counsel, as of course you would do, um, but the cover is prejudiced by the fact that the investigation isn't actually into the individual, but into the wider corporate entity. Um, so that's one area that needs to, to um, uh, be got right. Uh, just moving on to the, the timing of the trigger, I say that it is key. Well, it is key because um, the cost can um, snowball extremely quickly. Um, 
there should be cover for legal fees and expenses incurred in dealing with an investigation. Um, so following the, um, we talked about the informal stage and, and the formal stage um, a bit earlier. Um, any investigation um, may mean an, investi an, in an administrative inquiry or a request for information from a regulatory or professional body, but it will still need to arise from a formal investigation, as opposed, that is, to a routine regulatory visit. So the informal stage, where I think um, Barry mentioned earlier, that it's probably largely voluntary disclosure, um, that's a difficult area for insurers, and it's one that um, the insurance market is sort of wrestling with at the moment to extend cover for the costs incurred there. The, um, the difficulty with that is that when you're, when you're providing voluntary disclosure, quite often there hasn't been any, um, uh, well, allegation might not be the right word, but certainly no finding of wrongdoing. And insurers tend to really only like to respond when there's, uh, there's, there's pretty good grounds for suspecting that a wrongful act has been committed. There is no such thing as a standard policy in terms of response for regulatory investigations. Much will depend on the individual policy wording as regards the timing of the trigger. Um, we are seeing, for obvious reasons, because of the, uh, the extending footprint of the SEC and the FCA, a desire for insurers uh, to respond to losses a lot earlier than was historically the case. Um, from an insurer's perspective, it's usually the case that a high level of cost will be incurred, as we know, prior to the start of the formal investigation. Um, and the cost of an insured person or a regulated, regulated individual in complying with those requests um, should really be covered if possible. Um, but if those costs are incurred after the appointment of an investigator, and then external fees are incurred as a byproduct of the appointment of the investigator. That's when the cover should be very clear, and that's when insurers should then be stepping in to provide assistance to pay for those fees. Um, I suppose the last point to say is just that really, as as investigations broaden, and, and the costs which tend to be um, in the investigations that I've handled on behalf of our insurers, quite heavily front-loaded. We're talking, um, Barry was talking about the, the discovery process, um, you know, often associated with extremely high levels of costs. Um, there is the potential for insurers, I think, to extend um, the scope of their cover, especially under the DNO policies. And I suppose that's an area um, where brokers should be um, forcing the issue, issue with insurers. They're not going to voluntarily um, provide a, a broader level of cover, but it is a real um, exposure that's faced by the industry and one that needs to be picked up by the insurers as far as is possible. At that point, um, I'll hand over to James, who is on the insurer side, and probably be able to say why they don't want to insure those losses. Thanks, David. Um, my name is James Zuri. I work for Apsi Specialty, which is a, uh, uh, an insurer in the asset management sector. Um, we cover uh, managers largely in Europe, um, several of which are SEC registered. Um, just picking up on what David said, the, um, and just to be clear, the, 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 the point with this cover largely is uh, to provide um, cover for the costs in, a, in an investigation of some sort. Um, generally, fines and penalties are uninsurable by law, um, and, and so what, what we're really looking at here is, is, is to provide costs for the individuals uh, or for the corporates in defending themselves in a regulatory investigation. Uh, and, and David picked up on a point about the individuals, which I think is an important one. Um, pre previously, the, this, this cover would largely have been for the, the corporate and regulated entities. Um, but increasingly, we've seen regulators coming after individuals who hold certain control functions um, personally. And as David said, that's when... Uh, as an individual, you'll want the cover for yourself as opposed to relying on your employer um, to, uh, to help you out in that respect. So I thought I'd just talk briefly about how insurers see the potential exposures of asset managers and obviously then bring it back to the regulatory side. Um, 
In terms of the likelihood of having a, a claim or a loss under your insurance policy, um, operational losses are still by far and away the most likely. Uh, and by that I mean uh, you know, trade errors, missed currency hedges, breaches of mandates, uh, that kind of thing. Um, that, that we then come down to litigation. Um, David mentioned that the, the regulatory investigations are becoming more common and litigation less common. I think that's probably as we move away from 2008. Um, in 2008, there was, uh, there was a, a fairly large rash of um, litigation, particularly from investors who felt they'd been done, uh, hard done by. Um, and uh, so that's still the second most likely uh, um, route of a claim. But uh, regulatory investigations are the third most likely and are uh, increasing, as David said. The, um, the, the way we look at the, the regulatory exposures, um, if you look at the way an insurance policy is priced in, in, in the round, um, the, the insurers come up with base, a base premium for their capital. And, and bearing in mind, insurance, insurers' capital is generally fairly expensive. There are a number of costs in there, reinsurance costs, brokerage costs, as well as the capital costs themselves, um, plus, of course, paying, paying claims. Um, and so from that base price, uh, you'll tend to come out with a premium which will be based on the domicile of the, uh, the manager, the strategy, and the assets under management. Now, a lot of insurers will then uh, will spit that price out, and, and that will be the premium they charge to, to their clients. Um, the more sophisticated insurers will will then add further risk factors onto that, um, and you know the, the, they'll range from all the things that you present to your investors. So all of the things that would be best practice, um, the insurers will be looking for. So do you have multiple counterparties? Do you have a, 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 a big audit firm? Do you have significant investment in the funds yourselves? Uh, all the things that uh, the, the investors that you present to day in day out will be will be looking at. Um, in terms of the regulatory exposures, uh, it can be somewhat difficult to, to extrapolate exactly what proportion of cost you would put, an insurer would put towards the regulatory uh, exposures. But in trying to sort of work backwards the models that, uh, that we run, um, it's likely to be about sort of 10 to 15 percent would be derived from various regulatory um, exposures. Um, yeah, and they, they may well be uh, you know, compliance-based, so do you have a compliance officer, do you have a, a third-party compliance consultant, uh, and, and then more specifically into whether or not you're regulated by more than one regulator, which we see as a as risk, obviously. Um, there's a, a greater chance of you breaching uh, rules if you have different rules with which you need to comply. Uh, and we also, uh, from a, uh, an important risk point, look whether or not you're SEC registered, uh, and, and particularly whether or not you have employees in the U.S., so that's likely to draw you into um, SEC exposures. Um, so just in sort of closing, I'll just make a couple of comments on what what insurers are looking for. Um, the, my background is, uh, is is allocating to asset managers, primarily hedge funds, uh, on behalf of a, a fund of fund and then a, uh, a large investment consultant, so on behalf of um, sovereign wealth funds and pension funds. Um, the... Um, in, when you go through an insurance process, I think it's important that you, you put your best foot forward um, in the same way you do to your investors. So uh, you know, if you have a, um, a, a response plan um, around SEC um, investigations, then that's the kind of thing you should be, um, that you should be disclosing to your insurers uh, because that's, that will be taken into account when they're looking at your, at your premium. Uh, and, and I think, as a final point, I just mentioned that that more disclosure is always is always uh, beneficial. Uh, I know I know some people, some uh, managers are keen not to expose too much of themselves, but actually, in reality, uh, it will either keep costs down or uh, and or should I say um, uh, lead to less likelihood of a dispute in the event of a claim if the uh, the insurer that you use is aware of all of the activities that you're undertaking. And with that, I'll pass on to, to Kurt. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> just to give you some background on who I am, um, I've been a general counsel and CCO for a number of years. I've interacted with the SEC and their enforcement division, the parts of the SEC. I've also interacted uh, with the FCA or FSA, as it then was, and their enforcement division for 
Um, some public matters, um, you know, the Steve Harrison case, which was widely publicized, I dealt with the FCA on. Um, and something that, you know, I've come to find is that regardless of which regulator you're facing when it comes to enforcement actions, I think there are certainly common themes that apply to businesses. And what I wanted to highlight on this, uh, just going to the next slide, um, is, you know, that as a GC and CCO, I, I think, you know, there's a number of peers that I speak to, and I'm sure, you know, a number on this webinar listening, um, who don't really have a plan in place uh, to tackle facing enforcement. So if your firm is raided tomorrow, what would you do? Uh, if you received a subpoena tomorrow or a Wells notice or a letter of inquiry, um, do you have a plan to tackle, you know, this risk, which has been growing without question, just looking at the press or looking at, you know, the statements that the SEC has made, um, to ensure that your business isn't impacted in a negative way. It's always going to be a scary prospect to deal with any of these things. There's always going to be a number of different types of damage which occur, but I think most people, if they're honest, have had the plan, you know, to call the lawyers in, and not many have gone beyond that statement. Um, I've certainly been guilty of that over time, there's no question, and I think Having dealt with these departments and understanding, you know, that there are certainly a number of initiatives going on at the moment from the SEC that place managers who are not 110% focused on being SEC compliant, you know, having in place what the SEC expects to see, and perhaps are more at risk because, you know, you're dealing with FCA regulation and maybe you just haven't got round to doing everything in your SEC program, it's important to understand that, you know, this is a real risk to your business. If you are on their radar through your ADB registration reporting, being mentioned in the press, the type of trading you do, the fact that you're marketing in the U.S., whatever it may be, um, there is a risk. And I know a lot of people invest heavily, and I did this as well, um, in things like prep for audit and, you know, what really can I do beyond that may be a question in people's minds. Well, you know, it's very important to understand that Barry was talking, you know, earlier about the enforcement division at the SEC. That is not the same team that deals with audits. If you have an audit and you get a deficiency, you may get referred to enforcement and they may take it forward and go through the process Barry described but the enforcement division is a separate team with separate motivations, separate goals, um, and they can come knocking on your door at any time for virtually any reason, um, be it a fishing expedition or something more targeted, um, you know, like they suspect you of dealing, you know, a particular individual of uh, being a bad actor. So what we've noticed over time is that the environment has really changed. It's no longer the case that people who do bad things are investigated and that's it. You know, the chances of you getting an investigation or interaction with enforcement is greatly increased and you may, you may well have not done anything wrong. So what I wanted to emphasize today is that, you know, the enforcement division, the separate department in the SEC, can come to you for a large number of reasons. And, you know, we touched on them in the slide. It may include employees who are upset with you. And I think if you work in the fund industry, you'll know there are a lot of people like that. Um, you know, you may have had to let somebody go and they are angry with the firm. And people make things up. That is enough to trigger an action. And it may not, you know, come to a conclusion that, um, you know, warrants charges being brought, but the damage is already done when they begin investigating. You know, there is reputational damage, there's damage to the firm. So if we just move to the next slide. And, um, you know, what, what this webinar is really about is telling people that, you know, there is something that you can do, that, um, you know, times, although everybody is focused on, um, you know, cost, obviously, and, 
you have different services that you contract for, and most importantly, your time is limited. You know, you have to make sure your monitoring is up to speed. You have to make sure, you know, that you're ready for audit. It's also worth the time to sit down and have a think around what you would do if there was an enforcement action before they're actually there. Because I guarantee you that if you are trying to make decisions about the firm, how to deal with your investors, for example, checking whether your records are actually intact beyond just checking with your IT guy that the you know, archive system works, understanding how you might analyze five trades historically if you were asked to do so by the enforcement division. Those sorts of questions are questions to look at now. Um, make the time, because when you are facing the SEC um, in an adversarial environment where you're given, for example, a week to produce numerous documents and you're working till 2 in the morning to make sure that those are right, and then you have to check them with counsel. You don't have the time to sit down with the stakeholders in your business and say, okay, you know, I'm going to test IT. Is it working? Blah, blah, blah. You know, is this in place? Is that in place? All of these things uh, you find out don't work when you need them. If you, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure you can relate to that. Um, it's always the case, right? Something will let you down in the process. So it's better to have a think around what enforcement wants, what they may demand, and look at ways in which to mitigate um, issues that are going to crop up when you don't have time to resolve them and you find yourself most times, I think with enforcement actions at least, asking the regulator for more time when an enforcement action is something you want to have finished and concluded as quickly as possible um, because I guarantee you that your investors will be very, very focused on that. Um, they have reputational risk, you have reputational risk. Um, and frankly, our business is to look after investor interests and make sure that we're uh, focused on things like trading as opposed to whether the firm is going to shut down because of the damage that enforcement um, you know, actions may cause. Um, so just going to the next slide. So I think there is a shift in the market, and Bill will touch on this uh, in a second, but um, you know, investors are now looking for firms to address this new risk. Um, you cannot see stories about enforcement actions in the press every day and not begin thinking, well, you know, are we ready for this kind of um, change in the market? And I think you know, more operational due diligence type questions I think will be coming out about you know, how people are prepared for these actions. And what we're saying today is, you know, and it's really from experience, you know, hopefully you haven't faced this and, you know, it may never occur, but with the number of actions out there and the number of registered managers, it's certainly, you know, the odds are in favor of it happening to you sooner than later. Um, and one other thing, you know, being, a, you know, I've been a GC of a, a fund headquartered in London, um, it doesn't matter when you registered with the SEC. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, to the SEC really that, uh, you know, maybe you weren't facing U.S. investors at a particular time. They will look at everything that they feel like looking at irrespective. They will go back in time now that, you know, there is a statute of limitations based on, you know, what charges they can bring. But uh, don't think the week before you registered and filed your ADV that um, something going on in your firm is beyond the scope of their their scrutiny, because it, it certainly is. Um, and, you know, we're asking people in the market, I think, you know, um, who haven't experienced this to sit down and have a good think about what they can do to uh, make make an enforcement action, interaction as you know, seamless and, you know, quick as possible and hopefully as painless as possible. And uh, there is certainly planning around it which can help do that and help minimize the damage to businesses. But, you know, from, from what we hear over, over here uh, in the U.S., um, there's certainly focus by the regulator on managers they think aren't as focused on their programs as they should be. So, you know, uh, with that, I will hand over to Bill. Great, great. Thanks. Thanks, Kurt. Um, um, I guess really what I'm going to speak about is touching a couple of points. I think one thing to, to mention at the outset, and I think Barry made the point and, and others today made the point, but it is important to think about is that, you know, 
uh, quite, a, quite often when there is an interaction with enforcement, whether it goes through an informal investigation, then a formal, um, uh, you know, it could be with a firm that has actually done nothing wrong. So I know there's a lot of sort of scary talk here, but it's also meant to be realistic because we're definitely seeing uh, a continuing evolution and, and sort of shift in the compliance environment. I think to date, um, most people have really thought about the operation of their compliance program um, as, as something that would get them through sort of a routine audit as a function of them being registered. But I think what we're seeing to some degree, and it's on a number of fronts, is just sort of an, an evolution of the regulatory environment around private fund advisors. And, you know, you know, to some degree, I think you can compare and contrast to what you see in, let's say, some of the other more mature players in the financial industry. Like, you know, I think the, the, working, the working thesis now is that, um, or has been over the last few years, is that um, a private fund advisor facing an interaction in any way, shape, or form with, with, with enforcement, you know, could greatly rise the level of going out at business risk because there would be a concern among the investor base, people voting with their feet and redeeming. Um, but that's not the case with more, you would say, sort of mature players, your, your large banks. I mean, I, I don't think it makes anybody crazy at any given point in time to know that, you know, J.P. Morgan has, you know, an army of enforcement personnel from various regulators or enforcement type personnel from various regulators um, likely housed in their headquarters at any given point in time. And I think, you know, I, I think everybody who's on the phone knows that, you know, and, and I've been in the private fund industry since, since 1995, you know, from in the, in the last, you know, what will be, you know, getting close to 20 years, we've seen a large sort of, um, maturing and evolution of this industry, and I think that's going to be the case. It's also coming out of really sort of an extension and changes from the regulatory front since sort of the financial crisis of 2008. You know, we had, you know, uh, clearly the regulators as a whole came to the conclusion that they, they just did not have what they need to make risk-based evaluations as it relates to players in the market, um, products in the market, strategies. And coming out of Dodd-Frank, you saw an evolution where the first step was really much more expanded ADB disclosures focused at private funds. So you went from a point where you would answer, quote, unquote, you know, four questions about your private funds. Now it could be four pages of questions. You had the Form PF. You have the AIFMD Annex 4. Um, you had then the evolution where it became pretty common over the last year or so. Um, where you know, where, where you know, or, or where you'd see somebody in, from enforcement accompany OCIE on a regular uh, examination. Why? Because they wanted to learn more. They wanted to understand some of these private fund structures, and they know they may go in and ask questions of them. So I think people need to think of that as sort of the, that world sort of changing. And, and, and the theory is is that you know we're, we may see more interaction with enforcement. Uh, for private fund advisors in the coming years. Um, part of that will be a function of their much larger part of the investment advisor base. So even if you think about it in theory, although it is increasing, but in theory, if they did the same percentage of enforcement interactions with, with investment advisors or registered investment advisors that they did in 2005, in 2015, um, Probably in 2005, of 11,000 ish advisors, about maybe a thousand were private fund advisors. As a function of Dodd Frank, you've got like 4,300 of them are private fund advisors. So there'll be that piece, and I think it's just going to be this more expanding role of enforcement because they may look at things, they may ask questions, they may have interactions um, that they deem are warranted for a variety of reasons, where there isn't actually any wrongdoing and it does not result in 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 a, in, a, in a finding of wrongdoing. So really sort of proactively uh, thinking about that types of interaction is going to be good for your firm. And although you could argue where people knee-jerk reaction could be scary, it could be very investor friendly. Because the more you plan, you'll increase efficiencies on those interactions, which can be very sort of costly. Uh, the advanced prep could demonstrate to a regulator you know, how seriously you take it. You'll reduce co costs. And you could likely increase the likelihood of a shorter interaction, reduce distraction to the firm, uh, 
And so that, that takes me to the next slide where we'll sort of think about you know, just some high level sort of bullet points about what should response planning or, or regulatory interaction response planning make up. Obviously, it's, to a great degree, it'll be unique to different firms. Um, and number one, I think uh, what's an important point is that regardless of what kind of plan uh, a firm puts in place, uh, the experience enforcement council is always going to play the most important role um, as it relates to relating directly with enforcement, but I'm talking more about advanced planning. Um, and, and some areas where you would think about it is should you designate a regulatory response committee to, number one, manage prep and regulatory interactions and think about that on a going forward basis. Um, you should have some plan where you manage communications. And that's different than managing communications, obviously, in, in a normal audit. Um, so that you, how you discuss, how, what are your communication plans with investors, counterparties, the press? Um, you manage reputational risk. Um, should you have a separate set of reviews on identifying and manage conflicts of interest in an, in an interaction? It could be different than in your normal course of action, because let's say your interaction is due to potentially a disgruntled employee, would that result potentially in, in that being a new conflict? Should you maybe take things from your annual review and say, although we internally, for a variety of reasons, are comfortable that something that came up in our annual compliance review was not necessarily material or problematic, but how would we explain those findings to someone like enforcement and demonstrate to them how we reviewed it, how we thought about it, how we came to the conclusion? Um, I think Kurt's talked about, obviously, IT testing and the ability to produce documents. And also, a response plan could include uh, you know, expanded staff training. Um, and that's different than training your staff on the normal operation of your compliance program um, or your, the normal issues around you know, personal trading or political contributions or gift notices or record keeping requirements. It's definitely, it's, it's, and it's, it's really more what our thinking at the present is, is a lot of this is more practical organizational, administrative in nature of saying eventually we're going to have this interaction um, and, 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 and are we ready for it. Um, and then that takes me to, to, to the last slide is, is really uh, some other sort of rear view thinking as it relates to planning. Um, one thing we've seen in the last, or definitely according in the last eight to you know, seven, eight years is that you know, if I were to ask clients that were registered in 2003, 2004, they would say they, they probably would have thought that, that getting audited could be an end of business event. There was a tremendous amount of fear around it. Um, and I think in that case, although as I said, different from the context of having an interaction with enforcement, um, planning has shown that it has worked. Um, you have seen um, firms that have really demonstrated to the SEC when they have come in in a normal audit that planning and forward thinking and, and, and knowing that that interaction is going to be part of their you know, doing business in this area has lowered risk profiles, um, has made those you know, audits definitely smoother and faster and shorter time frame. Um, and again, I think it, it, it could do a lot. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, thinking about this type of planning, uh, especially in, 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 in the context of an interaction with enforcement, um, although, you know, you could see how maybe certain investors would go, oh, my God, why are you planning for enforcement? But there's a lot of very pro-investor reasons. We talked about reducing costs. Well, God forbid, let's say you've done nothing wrong, and you've never thought about it, and you go into enforcement, and the bullets are flying, and things are all over the place, and you're not able to really quickly and demonstrably demonstrate to, 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 to the enforcement how you have a handle on things. Well, it could, it could result in a much longer, much more burdensome, much more, you know, uh, interaction, and it could reduce the likelihood, it could increase the likelihood that some investors will go, you know what, I just, I'm, I'm not going to wait around on this one. I'm going to start to redeem. And then, you know, the investors are hurt because when they're redeeming, everybody on the street will know that people are redeeming. It will likely be in a distress scenario. They will reduce the, 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 the losses there will directly flow through to the, 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 the investors. Um, let's say it is that firm that just appears in disarray but actually did nothing wrong. Well, those increased costs around the enforcement, they will be borne by the investors, either directly through the indemnification provisions or maybe indirectly through sort of insurance-related costs. So 
that's really where you know I think where we would I, I would leave our thinking on today's webinar is just uh, people should just start thinking about this, thinking about it as being a reality, and how can they use lessons they've learned in other areas of their firm's operations, where a tremendous amount of pre-planning, and that could be as I said, interactions or the course of normal audit, people pre-plan around operational DD interactions with big investors. And that increases the smoothness and efficiencies around those. It's just it's something that um, everybody should be thinking about. Um, with that, I think we end. Uh, we're at the end of sort of our formal uh, presentation. Um, to the extent anybody has any questions I mentioned earlier, um, you know, feel free to 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 log a question in on the on the right hand side of the panel. It looks like I've got a couple of questions already, uh, which I will throw out to the to the panel and, and be happy to see if, if, if who's interested in answering. First question we have is how would, the, how would a regulator view this kind of planning and does this kind of planning suggest guilt? I don't know who would like to chime in on that. This is Barry. I'm, I'm, happy, to, I'm happy to answer that from, from a defense lawyer perspective. Um, for, first of all, um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't think that, uh, uh, I don't think any regulator would appropriately consider this kind of planning to be indicative of guilt. And, 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 and remember, if you actually do it, you're not going to, I mean, you're going to do it maybe with the assistance of counsel, either in-house counsel or outside counsel, so the exercise might be cloaked in privilege. Um, but really the steps that you're taking are, are prudent steps to take, whether whether you're labeling them as somehow related to an anticipated investigation or not. I mean, you know, testing how your system, stress testing your systems, like Kurt suggested, for how would you have to, you know, how could you, you know, if you had to pick five or ten trades and arbit arbitrarily and analyze them, how would you do that? that that's, that's, that's a sensible thing to do, you know, all apart from the context of enforcement. Um, uh, uh, likewise, confirming that what you're archiving really is there, really is available. I mean, those are all sensible things to do. You can do those even with, with, with the, the idea of preparing for an enforcement investigation, but without necessarily labeling it like that. And you can always do it with counsel. Great. Um, see, it looks like we've got another question coming in. Um, what types of firms are the SEC uh, targeting? Well, Barry, you're you're welcome to chime in if you'd like. Sure. Um, well, I mean, the, the SEC has priorities, so you know, certainly, certainly, investment advisors and and hedge fund advisors are a, a priority. Uh, 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 private equity is becoming more of a priority, um, uh, you know. But their array of you know firms that they look at, are, uh, you know, that aside, have often been the same. I mean, you know, broker dealers, public companies. Is there some more specificity you're seeking beyond that? No, I think I think that gets at the question. I guess another question we have, which will probably be the last question because we're a bit over on time, um, how much SEC investigation activity are we currently seeing in relation to UK-based RIAs? How does this compare to historical levels of activity over the last few years? I, I'm, I'm happy to chime in, and then if 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 any one of uh, Barry or Kurt, I mean, I think you know clearly we've seen. Um, you know, and it was probably around this time, maybe a month earlier, this time last year, uh, increased activity on the normal routine audit perspective. And there was, you know, um, a trip made to London by the SEC, and they examined a number of players on the ground. I can't say that in our experience we saw people come out of that, which ended up in enforcement, but I don't know if anybody else on the panel has any other perspectives. I mean, we're certainly hearing people talk more about dealing with enforcement. And obviously, 
there are issues around disclosure of investigations. People are very sensitive about what they can talk about. I don't have empirical data to support an increase in targeted, you know, UK managers, but um, it does feel like as part of the general increase in the number of investigations, which is public information, um, that more and more people in the UK are being um, are being looked at by the by the enforcement division. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you from the U.S. perspective, there's obviously quite a bit of increased activity, um, and you know whether that means that's something foreboding because you know we obviously saw a tremendous amount of increased activity on the audit examination front coming out of Dodd Frank, and then sort of hit that second cycle. I don't know if that will necessarily play itself true, but one would think that that would be a possibility. Um, I'll, I'll only add one, one other caveat. I think if you look at them statistically, the number of enforcement actions, actually charges brought, cases where there are charges brought, you'll see that the SEC probably brought more this year, I think, it's, it's fiscal year for 2014 just ended than, than year, the year past. But what I think really, really matters more than that is the intensity in which they're conducting the investigations and the types of legal and factual issues that they consider to be enforcement-worthy infractions as opposed to years past. Well, great. Well, I think that's about it. I mean, we're, we're a bit over. Uh, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to participate in today's webinar. Um, hope you found it useful. Uh, and obviously, on behalf of Cordium, I want to thank the entire uh, panel. Um, um, uh, Barry, David, James, and Kurt, I thought uh, the panel did a fantastic job, and hope you join us again at, at future webinars that, that, that we, uh, we put out there. Thank you very much.